One of the things you and I should never, never, ever come into the house of the Lord or gather in, even in the life of uh, the e church without taking the time to worship. We can come into the building, we can do a lot of stuff and still leave without worshiping. But every now and then we need to press the pause button, block out all the distractions, block out all that's going wrong around us. The Bible tells us of a publican would be would consider a sinner and a Pharisee. Both in the house and the Bible says the Pharisee held up his head and he says, Lord, I'm so thankful. I'm not like other people. I do this for you. And he began to go down the list of all the things, all the religious stuff that he did for the Lord. But the Bible says the publican would not even so much as hold up his head, but he held down his head, smote himself on the breast, and he said, Lord, have mercy upon me. And I don't know about you, but when I come into this season of worship, I'm reminded of just how unworthy I am. I'm reminded of the holiness of God. I'm reminded of the fact that but for God's mercy, you and I would have been consumed. And all we have to do is to look where God has brought us from. All we have to do is to remind ourselves of what God has brought us from. I don't know about you. But I know I have a testimony this morning. And sometimes you can't make your testimony public. Sometimes you can't even tell folks where God has brought you from. But like the woman with the alabaster jar, every now and then you got to open up something precious to God and say, for where you have brought me from, God, I want to give you the glory and the praise. For indeed, you are worthy of our praise. And this morning, Father, we're humbled by your grace. We're humbled by your mercies. We're humbled because we know we do not deserve your mercies. But here we are in your house. Here we are gathered even in the e-church, even in that global space, for one purpose, to say thank you, Lord. We worship you this morning, not just because of what you have done for us. God, we just want to worship you for who you are. We lift our voices this morning, and we say how great thou art. We worship you today. We worship and adore your name. And we bless your name. Somebody give God a praise offering wherever you are. Forget who's beside you. Forget who's around you. And give God a praise offering this morning. For he's worthy of our praises. This morning I want to direct our thoughts to Joshua chapter 1. And while you're finding it, I just want to salute every one of you in the name of the Lord grateful to the Lord for his mercy, grateful for his preserving grace. God is so good to us. And of course, even as I continue to remind us, this is transition year. So if you have somebody close to you, just tell them we are in transition. <laughs> this is transition year. And that means we if there's ever a time we need to be focused, block out all the distractions, and zero our mind's eyes on what God is doing, it is now. And so I want to direct our thoughts to the word of the Lord in Joshua chapter 1, and it reads, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses is minister saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, 
unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates. All the land of the Hittites and unto the great sea, towards the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Be strong. Oh, come on, church. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swore unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from me to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart of them out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the host and command the people, saying, Prepare your victuals. For within three days you shall pass over the Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth to you to possess. To the Reubenites and to the Gadites and to half the tribe of Manasseh spake Joshua, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God has given you rest, and hath given you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of Jordan, but you shall pass over your brethren armed, all the mighty men of valor, and help them. Unto the Lord have given your brethren rest, as he has given you, and they also have possessed the land which the Lord your God giveth them. Then you shall return unto the land of your possession, and enjoy it, which Moses' his servant the Lord's servant gave you on this side of Jordan. And they answered Joshua, saying, Hear this clearly. All that you commandest us, we will do. And whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go. According as we have hearkened unto Moses in all things, so will we hearken unto thee. Only the Lord thy God be with thee as he was with Moses. Whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment, and will not hearten unto thy words in all that thou commandest him. He shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Surely want to thank God for his grace. And um, last week, um, Sunday um, evening, as we spent some time on Urban Ministry 101. And we want to um, encourage our congregation uh, when we when we do these um, um, congregational trainings, we want everyone to be a part of it, and we were so grateful and excited. Last week we had about 102 um, units logged in, and that was exciting. And of course, um, Brother Kyle um, Peacock um, led the first um, presentation, and um, the next one. We have a special, Marcus is going to lead that presentation. And one of the interesting things, um, if we're going to go in and possess what God has promised us, we're going to have to do things differently than we have done in the past. Amen. Now, it is, it is easier said than done, um, even during this season. And by the way, I want to give a shout out to all of our seniors who have not been able to be in the building for now almost a year. But as I touch base, and one of, um, was so grateful, as one of um, our seniors um, in conversation said, Pastor, I know we have never seen this before, but I want you to know we are praying for you every day because we know it cannot be easy. And of course, I will not even begin to take credit. I believe the fact that God has kept us stable and has given us the grace 
to continue to stay together and to serve the congregation is directly dependent upon the quality leadership that we have in our church. So I want you to join with me as we celebrate all of our leaders. Um, you cannot begin to imagine. Um, you talk about the long hours and just trying to make sure every household is covered. So um, we have the prayer lines on a daily basis and different means of reaching out. And we want you to understand you don't even have to be a member of our church to call for help. We are here to serve the community. And so we're thankful to the Lord for his grace and excited. We, we, we appreciate what God has done in the past, but we're extremely excited about where God is taking us. And so last week, as I spoke to you on the trouble with trust, um, trust is a very fragile thing. Trust takes a lifetime to build and can be fractured within a short time. And a, a, a relationship which has been interrupted because of a trust issue takes a long time to rebuild. Nothing worse than you bearing your soul to someone. Tell them all the things you're struggling with. And then somehow the relationship goes south. And then after a while, now you have to rebuild that trust which has been broken. And so the same way that um, the enemy goes after the trust factor in your relationship, the same thing is the same thing with even marriages. What the devil does, he doesn't go after your house. He doesn't even go after your job. He goes after the trust issue because what keeps a marriage together, it's not money, it's not a house, it's the trust issue. And the same applies even in our relationship with God. And so every now and then, when, when, when there's a mountain before you, and you begin to tremble, and anxiety begins to take over, and you ask yourself, God, how are you going to do this, and how am I going to come through? And what the devil wants you to do is to lose faith in God. But I want you to understand, if God was in control before COVID-19, the same God is still in control. And in spite of the anxiety of this new reality, I still believe that our anchor holds and grips the solid rock. And when there is confusion in the economy and confusion in politics, we know who is still in control. His name is Jehovah, the I am that I am. So every now and then, you need to let the devil know where your faith lies, not in your job, not in your bank account, not in your possessions, but upon God's word. And so now we're, we're going to tie together the, 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 the issue of trust and transition. Because many times your, the trust is tested in transition. So I want to talk to you for the next few moments on the trust that conquers transition. And transition, simply, my friends, is just progressive change. Transition just simply means you're going through a change. Now, I know that uh, many of us um, sometimes have difficulty. Uh, I remember when I had to get my, my, my glasses. Um, I, I could see pretty far. And then I discovered I wasn't seeing things as clear as I used to see them. Now, here's what happens. And so when you come to that realization, you have to make a choice. Either you're going to look a little older or you're going to see clearer. You're going to make a choice. And, and so I thank God for all the different styles and whatever. But here's what happens. The fact is sometimes we come even to that place where we realize our body doesn't heal as fast as it used to. Now, do I have a witness? No, I, I mean, there were times I remember, oh, my God, when we could, well, sometimes you can't confess some things on the podium. But we could hang out all night. Two hours sleep. And next morning you show up at work 
and you work right through the day as clear-headed as ever and everyone thinks man you got your eight hours in they had no idea you parted out all night last night stayed up late and barely made your two hours in and nowadays if you don't get your sleep, we can tell a mile off. You, you don't walk straight. You don't look like yourself. What happens is as we go through transition, we come to the reality that life is a process of change. And by the way, friends, the day you stop growing, you stop changing. So change is not necessarily bad. Here's what happens. Change is a necessary sign of progress or growth. And so just like in school, um, the, when it comes to graduation, one of the things they try to do with graduation is to remind the students that when they gra after graduation, not to show up at school. The idea is you may still feel young, but you have to now embrace reality. And so the, 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 the leadership of the school would try to remind the graduates that after you graduate, even though you look at yourself, you still look the same way, but you're now in a different um, scope. The same thing applies even in companies. After you've worked in a company for a long time and you now get to a place of retirement, some people lose their identity after retirement. And so some folks, after retirement, they go depressed. They have no idea what to do with their lives. And so in retirement or before retirement, they have to prepare the employees what life would most likely be like after retirement. In prison, when someone is prepared to be released, that probation officer or parole officer spends some time with them and reminds them that in a few days or weeks, you're going to be released. And after you are released, you won't have anyone telling you to get up. You won't have anyone telling you to go find a job. You're going to have to now make the adjustment after you are released. The same applies even to the military. What they did study in working with um, vets is that their preparation before they leave the military is so essential to their survival after they leave. And, and, and so one of the things they discovered is that uh, when, when the vet, they, they, they say there are about four or five things the vets struggle with. After they leave the service, they struggle with that sense of purpose. So when they signed up for the military, they knew why they were in the military. They had a purpose to their lives. And so after they retire, now it's almost like, hello, who needs me? No one is, um, is, is, is beckoning you for you to come and rescue them. They also discover that in that season of retirement, not only do they struggle with purpose, they many times struggle with the chains of commands. So when you're in the military or in the service, when you get an order, you respond. But after you leave the military or the whatever era of service, it's almost like, who's going to tell me what to do? Well, most times a spouse is already waiting. I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say that. we got to pull roll that one back in. But the next thing they say they struggle with is also the promotional structure. When you're in the military, you say, what's my duty? And you're putting your time, and then promotion is due. And if everything goes well, you're promoted. Well, after you leave the military, now how do you earn merit points? Another thing they may struggle with in, 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 the, in, the, in the service, they go on a mission, and so there's the rush. Man, after the mission is over, they come back. And it's like they're waiting for the next mission. And so that's why even sometimes after someone has spent time in the military and they're now discharged, they re-sign up. They re-enlist. Because they love the adrenaline of being on a mission. And the next thing that um, they, they, they said about the fifth thing that they struggle with is isolation. Because when they're in the service, they're a part of a team. They're part of the troop. They're a part of a brotherhood or of a group. And so after they have retired, 
It's like now they feel a loneliness that many struggle with. So transition is very important. I, I, I was, uh, most of us, I'm sure, um, watched what happened in Washington, D.C. last week. And I, I, I was reading an article um, I found very interesting by Christopher Ingraham. It's entitled, Democracy Dies in Darkness. And what he basically suggested is that one of the things that gave rise to what we saw in D.C. last week was the fact that across the world, America has one of the longest transition periods of any country. That means on average, after the presidential election, until the inauguration, you're running about 74 days. Most countries, after you have selected a new leader, parliament installs them, and so in a short time, they're standing up and they're swearing in. In the United States of America, the president of the, the president elect is in waiting for over 70 days before he has the authority to effect his, uh, his job. So regardless of all the issues happening, transition is necessary, but transition can also be dangerous. Because in the season of transition, the old leadership can make decisions that the new leadership is going to have to live with. And so what happens is we have got to realize as Christians, as believers, we are in transition. That means from the moment you accept Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, you move from being just a citizen of this world to a citizen of another kingdom. And so you are now in transit. Oh, my God. And here is what happens. And so God has made a promise over our lives. And so here's what happens. Last week, I reminded you that the children of Israel were delivered out of Egypt. And they could have marched into their promise within a two Two weeks period but because of unbelief God brought them all the way up to the border of their promise and all they had to do was to step in and possess their promise but when unbelief rises up you will do anything to delay where you are I've come to say to somebody what God has for you in the transition moment is far greater than what you and I have right now oh some Sometimes we hold on to things too long, too tight, and not realize that what God has in the next season is greater than you and I are holding on to. I remember some years ago, we, we were in, in Canada, and a young woman, and she looked probably in her, I would suggest, early 40s. And that's, gen, that's just an observation. Never ask her age. And she came to me as a pastor. She said, I need a reference for a job I'm applying for. And so after we sat in the office and, and she began to tell me, uh, you, uh, I said, okay, tell me what are some of the things, what is your qualification, what are some of the, 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 the attributes or, or strengths. And just having that conversation, I discovered she had been working in a motel for 18 years as a cleaner. For 18 years, she has been showing up every day at this motel to clean this motel. And so my curiosity was piqued. I said, what benefits were they giving you? None, sir. Wait, wait, wait. Are you suggesting that if you didn't show up for work, you weren't paid for that day? She says, yes, sir. She had absolutely no benefits, no pension, no retirement program. And she had spent 18 years of her life cleaning not a hotel, a motel, and a daily base for 18 years. And without thinking, it just came out. And sometimes some things just 
follow I said, my God, I wish they had fired you. Because what happens is for 18 years, she had learned to live on a mediocre salary with no benefits or retirement. And I've come to say to somebody today, many of us are in a worse situation. We are in a place of just existence. And God says, I have more in store for you. Can I say to somebody today, the promised land is not heaven. Canaan, when God was telling them, I've given you a land that wherever you put your foot, it is already yours. It is, you see what, because many of us confuse the promised land with, with heaven. You see what happens is in the promised land, there were enemies they had to defeat. In the promised land, there were stuff they had to fight for. But in heaven... There is no enemy in heaven. There is no fighting in heaven. There's no competition in heaven. All we got to do is worship him all day long. Can I say to somebody today, God has a promise over your life in this world. God has a promise over your life and he has declared it. And all you have to do is to walk in and claim what God has provided. Now here's what happens as I told you last week that they, they, they said to Moses, no, 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 let's not put the people at risk. Let's send in 12 spies. And the Bible says they took the leader from each tribe and send them in. And they came back and 10 of them said, no, we were like grasshopper in the eyes of those people. And Joshua and Caleb says, we can take the land. And I'm telling you, the more it resonates in my spirit, I thought to myself, you see, they had the mentality of a grasshopper. But Joshua and Caleb had the mentality of eagles. They said, if God gave it to us, then we can soar in and take what God has promised. And I'm here to say to us, every day we are forced to make the decision. To follow the grasshopper of doubt or the eagle of faith. Every day you have to make decisions. How are you going to live in these troublesome times? And I've come to remind someone that faith has never lost out yet. Because when God gave a promise to Abraham, he says, Abraham, I'm going to bless your seed. Abraham, I'm going to bring you into the land. Abraham, right in, Gen in Genesis, he made the promise. So here they are in Numbers. And the Bible says, because of doubt, they turned around and... By chapter 16, they're having rebellion. So here's what the first thing I want to, throw, to understand is that God s says to a, um, Joshua, Joshua, it's time for you to step up and be the leader. Now, now here's the amazing thing because a lot of folks want to lead for the profile, not for the responsibility. <laughs> <clears throat> Before Joshua was called to lead, he was support. Can that sink in? Can that sink in for a little while? Because before God brings you up to the place of leadership, you have to learn the discipline of support. You want to know a good leader? Watch how they assist the leader. And now, now, now here's what happens because some people believe that leadership is just telling other folks what to do. But leadership is not telling folks what to do. Leadership is modeling what folks need to do. That means as a leader, you have to step in and be the first to model the way. <clears throat> and so here's what happens. He says, Joshua, Moses is dead. And now I am appointing you his replacement. Yes, it's amazing that God has never made important decisions through a committee. God gives direction. He says, this is the direction I want you to go. And he doesn't need the majority to decide. 
He says this is the direction. I know democracy is important. But when it comes to the kingdom of God, theocracy is what matters. And so he says, Joshua, I'm raising you up as the leader. And so here's what happens. He says, um, Joshua, I'm raising you up so that you can lead the people in. Leadership is important for where the people end up. It's never about you. It's never about your welfare. It's always about the people. And here's what happened. He says, I'm calling you. Now you're going to lead the people. And here's what he says. There is a call, Joshua. I know you have never been in this role before. My God, can you imagine everyone come? No, 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 one of the things we always laugh about because when you even become a pastor, after a long term pastor, someone is always telling you, we didn't do it this way before. <laughs> so imagine you taking over a congregation after the pastor before you. The only pastor they have ever seen served for almost 40 years. And now God says, you got to step up. And I'm here to say to somebody today, in whatever place or role, God is raising you up to lead. Don't worry about what happened before. Just know that God is with you. And if God is with you, he will give you grace. He says, Joshua, just remember, he says, I'm calling you, Joshua, to have confidence in me. He says, Joshua, your confidence is not in who's around you. Your confidence is not in who supports you. Your confidence is not in your experience. Your confidence is in Almighty God. And here's what he says. Now here, you got to understand. He says, now I want you to take the law. And I want you to meditate. I want you to meditate upon the law. In other words, I want you to spend serious time. Now I, I, I know because and, and many times we define spiritual calling only within the context of the church building. And so many times we look at where we are in the church building. And we believe that if God is going to promote us, it has got to be in the church building. But I'm here to say to somebody today, if there is anything that COVID-19 can teach you, is that what God has for you has nothing to do with the church building. When God is ready, he will elevate you. When God is ready, he will make you prominent. Now be there for that because many times we see spiritual work only in terms of church work. But when God raised up Joseph, it was not to be a priest. When God raised up Joseph, it was not to be a prophet. When God raised up Joseph, it was to be an administrator in the kingdom of Egypt. Can I say to somebody today that God can have a plan for you to rise up in your company, in a corporation, in some sphere that he has placed you. And you need to understand that when God establishes you, you, you should know the manual and you should know the policy, but never take your head out of the book stay in the book know the word of God let the word of God resonate in your heart and he says and you got to get to a place where you don't have to prove yourself to anyone that God has called you I miss today we live in a world which is so competitive and a lot of times Folks believe they have to drag you down for them to stand a little higher. But I've come to say to somebody today, when God is ready, he will raise you up. When God is ready, he will elevate you. When God is ready, you don't have to disparage anybody's character. When God is ready, I hear the word of the Lord say, promotion doesn't come from the east nor the west. Promotion comes from Almighty God. 
It doesn't matter who is the mayor. It doesn't matter who is the council. It doesn't matter who is the president. When God is ready, he will raise you up. But you got to be ready to step in. And God says to Joshua, Say, God, <coughs> God gave, God gave Joshua important commands. And then Joshua turned and challenged the people. And so Joshua said to the people, he says, I want you to prepare yourself. I hope we recognize that we are in preparation. That's why it's not when we do a, a 21 days fast. It has nothing to do with your weight. When we do a 21 days fast, it's not about you lose. No, when we do a 21 days fast, it's about spiritual preparation for where God is taking us. And so Joshua says to the people, get yourselves ready for we are about to cross over. Can I say to somebody today, your crossover may not be a river. Your crossover may just be the street. But the point is God is about to get you to cross over to a different realm of functioning and prominent. He says to the people, get ready. In three days, I love what he said. He instructs them. He said, we're going to sanctify. We're going to sanctify ourselves. We're going to ask God to clean us up. My God, I want you to understand. I hope and pray that there are some things we didn't bring over into 2021. When you think of how the devil, when the devil knows that God has a plan for your life, when he knows he has a plan for your business, when God, when the devil knows God has a plan for your family, God, the devil cannot frustrate. He cannot stop what God has promised over your life. And so what the devil will do, he will set up distraction. What the devil will do, he will have the wrong association. The devil knows he can't stop what God has pronounced but if he can distract you and a lot of us in the midst of transition we get confused my god people can you gotta understand that if you had to talk to your friend every day for them to feel secure you have the wrong friend if you have to be on the phone an hour of the day and the day you miss one day phone call they begin to panic that somehow you have found another friend that's not a friend that's a burden in this year 2021 you need to you need to put down everybody you're carrying everybody who is easily offended everybody you gotta pat them every day i love you i love you i love you if you gotta spend all of that energy you gotta say to yourself my god this is the day that god is raising up a support not folks to meet now here's what happened because there are going to be some people in your lives that they know you have a promise over your life and so because they haven't spent time to find out what god has over their plan he does plan for their life they will try to attach themselves with the goal that when you get promoted, then they will get promoted. Can I say to somebody today, if your promotion is dependent on who is the boss, then what are you going to do when the boss is transferred? Then all of a sudden, your security goes. But if your promotion is based upon God, if your promotion is predicated on God's favor, it doesn't matter if the boss leaves. It doesn't matter if your supervisor leaves. If you know why God has placed you there you can stand with confidence so Joshua said to the people it is time to cross over now I want you to understand there are some people you can never bring with you across Jordan I said there are some folks who were kind to you 20 years ago when you were homeless they took you in when you couldn't find a job, they helped to feed you. And I believe in loyalty. I believe that when God has used people to bless you, it is wonderful to look back and be a blessing. But you can bless them without carrying them. You can bless them without dragging them. You got to know that God has determined a new season. And here's what he says. He says, we're about to cross over. 
but he reminded the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh. Now, now, it's, it, now this, this part of scripture always confuses me a little. Because if you draw the line right here, and on this side is the other side of Jordan. And the promised land is on this side. And because of the fertile fields on this side, outside of the promised land, these three tribes, because they had a lot of cattle, they came to Moses and they said, Moses, we have so much fertile land outside of the promise that would you give us permission to settle outside of the promise and Moses says okay if you want to and so Reuben Gad and the half of Manasseh because their, their, their tribes had and they had a lot of herd a lot of herds and cattle they settled but here's the promise they could leave their wives and children on this side but they had to go in with the other tribes and defeat the inhabitants so that the other tribes could settle and that was the responsibility to what Moses really saying to them before you you can leave your kids here but you're gonna have to go in and fight to take the land and of course Joshua reminded them of this responsibility and they did and they went in no no here's the amazing thing that years later when they were invaded by the Assyrians you know who were the first ones taken? <laughs> the same tribes that were outside. They were borderline. Can I say to somebody today, what God has for you, you can't settle on the border. What God has for you, you got to go in and take the land. Don't settle for a little sanctification. Don't settle for a little Holy Ghost. Don't settle for a borderline holiness. You got to go all in. Because if you're on the border, you'll always be vulnerable. If you're on the border, you're going to be an easy target. You got to bury yourself in the Holy Ghost you gotta bury yourself in everything God has for you because they settled on that side they became easy targets for later invasions and so here's something the people said after Joshua challenged the people to sanctification to crossing over the Bible says and the people made a decision they made up their minds we're gonna surrender to God's will all you and I can imagine all they had to do was to look back 40 years now I must confess that I have spent times and look back at things I have given myself to that have taken up valuable time and produced little and I've come to discover the devil doesn't mind you are busy as long as you're busy with the wrong thing. So here's what happens. All they had to do was to think 40 years. They lost their parents. They lost their grandparents. They lost their great grandparents. They walked 40 years. And all, at this time, all they had to do was to look back at 40 years of losses. Now I want you to know, church, that if I'm going to be honest, I try, I love the spirit of Nehemiah, because there are times, even as I pray for our church, I also have to pray for the decisions we have made in the past. I also have to pray about the opportunities we have missed in the past. Because you know what happens? We have made progress in some areas, but we have also missed some opportunities. Is there any honest person who would say, Pastor, we have missed some opportunities? And I want you to understand this. Last year, we celebrated 50 years, and I said, God, if you will help me, I will not miss another opportunity for this church to advance as a light in this city. Not only did they give themselves to surrender, but they said, we are going to submit to God. Joshua, as we followed Moses, we're going to follow you. I know you're younger and much less experienced. But Joshua, if you're the person God has raised up, we're going to submit ourselves to your leadership. 
Can I tell you something? You know a person is spiritual based on their willingness to submit themselves to spiritual authority. That's not my, that's not my word, that's the word of the Lord. But, but here's what he says. And he says, and the people says, we will separate ourselves from anybody with a rebellious spirit. I said, no, that went even further. They said, Joshua, anyone who gives you a hard time, we're going to kill them. No, that's, that's the word of the Lord. He says, anyone who harbors a spirit of rebellion, there will not be another chorus. There will never be another Korah. There will never be another a mighty rebellion because all they had to do was to look back and see what it has cost them. A couple of weeks ago, I had a chance to speak to Miss Green Walker, the district manager for Community Board 16. And as we talked about Ebenezer Plaza, and as we talked about some of the programs we were already operating and assured her that this church was praying for community board 16 more than we have ever done why because that's the next place of our location now here's the amazing thing because anytime people are in transition there's always a part of you that wants to hold on to the past. And the other part of you wants to reach out for the new. And it can never work. Because you can never move forward and backward at the same time. So I begin to have this conversation with her. Because even on, some, somebody comes to me and says, but pastor, with all the crime, I said, wake up, let me tell you the stats. Because I said for the past 16 years, 17 years, I have worked with the 67 priests and counts, um, clergy council. And 67, this um, region is 73. And I said, do you know one of the hottest places in Brooklyn? It's not 73, it's 67. And I said, we have lived in six, we have functioned in 67 precincts all these years I said there were times there were shootings down the block there were shooting down that block I said I just never told you how many times the police came and checked my cameras to see what happened right across the street but I said when the devil knows that where God is bringing you there's an open door he will make you panic and make you begin to doubt. But I've come to say to the devil this morning that God has really raised us up at such a time as this. And if God be our helper, the same way he has given us grace, the same way he has given us favor, well, I'm here to say that God's grace, we are planning with the help of God, even in making a five minutes drive from here to Ebenezer. But a major step in how we engage with the community. So I'm calling the entire church into prayer this week for the six, the community board 16. I know we're in our season of prayer. We're praying about transition. And just so you know, it, we're talking about a, a, um, a space we will talk more about in the next weeks just around 87,000 people. A diverse community. And God is calling us to an open opportunity for us to bring the light in a dark space. As we stand to our feet this morning, we know it's not about a building. It's about spiritual impact. We don't know the, 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 um, the folks who will live in the apartments above us. We have no idea where they're coming from. But one thing, we have made a commitment that when we purchased that property about 13 years ago, we made a promise 
that God being our helper, we're going to bring a torch over into this space. And we are praying that God will cause the flame of his spirit to, to just glow in such a dimension that the, the world will know that there is still a group of people who are not worried about earthly power or earthly fame, but who have made one commitment to impact the darkness around us. I'm going to invite us this morning, this morning for the next few moments, we're going to pray for Community Board 16. We're going to pray for the district manager. We're going to pray for the 73rd precinct. We're going to pray for every household in this community board 16. And here is the power. Here is the consolation we have. That when two or three gather in anything that pertains to his name, here is what God says. I will be in the midst to bless and do good. Before we can even make the physical transition, we have to make the spiritual transition. That means we have to take ownership of that area. We got to say to the devil, we are coming to take back God's territory. We're coming to say to the homeless, there is a better way. We're coming to say to the addicted that there is still a God of deliverance. And for I me, mean, I, 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 I encourage you because Di knows when I go home now, when I leave the office, I deliberately drive right down. Hegeman and New Lots. Why? As I drive down that corridor, I'm praying. I'm praying for the households. I'm praying for the businesses. And, I, I, and here's the thing that strikes me. As I'm, Ed, I'm driving down, and there, this, um, as I, this um, you, see the fo you see folks coming out with their bag with alcohol. They walked in intoxicated, and they're coming out with more alcohol. Because the devil knows if you can sedate a person, you will never have to worry about them setting, getting free. In other words, alcohol has become, even during COVID-19, a major trap of the enemy to entrap our people. A lot of times we go, our problem is not a black and white problem. Our problem is not a race problem. Our problem is a sin problem. And we have to open our eyes and see how the devil is destroying our families right around us. But we're not here to talk about the darkness. We're here to celebrate the light because there is still a light from heaven that is able to break every yoke, that's able to break every addiction, and that is able to raise the standard of this neighborhood for the glory of God. So as we bow our heads in prayer, I want to invite you as we go before the Lord in prayer, whether you're in the building and whether you are on, um, the, in the E-Church, wherever you're located, for this year, we're zeroing in our focus on this corridor. God has blessed us, as Reverend Gail reminded us earlier. God has blessed us. We have sent $10,000 to Cambodia. We have assisted missionaries around this world, even during COVID-19. You can imagine that when COVID-19 struck, many missionaries who would come back stateside and raise funds um, would have the challenge. And we, as a congregation, we have sent thousands of dollars to assist different missionaries who are laboring in the field. So in the midst of all that we have been doing, I am so grateful that God has given us the opportunity to still be a blessing to others. But for this year, all our focus, we're going to laser in on this corridor and we're going to pray that by the time we move over into that building in the later in the fall, that this community will feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
we're going to pray and fast for this neighborhood that God will raise a standard, that this government will recognize that something has shifted in Brownsville. And it's not because of corporation. It's not because Google moved into Brownsville. It's not because Apple moved into Brownsville. But a local congregation extended our hearts and moved into Brownsville. And because of God's grace, we have, with his help, raised the standard for his glory. Father, we bow our hearts before you today. Grateful, Lord, for your mercies. Grateful, Lord, that our destiny is not tied up with who's in the White House. That, God, the work that you have ordained and the work you have commanded us is not determined by who is the mayor. You have called us for such a time as this. Father, we thank you for what you did on the Bishop Peter and the Bishop Guy Notice. We thank you, God, for what you did under Bishop Peter Gale. We thank you for what you did under Bishop um, Lindsay Ascot. Today, Father, we renew our commitment as a church. Father, we know that you have done wonders in the past. But this morning, in the name of Jesus, we humble our hearts and we pray, sanctify us. Sanctify us as a leadership. Sanctify us as a church. God, even as we make the transition, we take authority over every spirit of Korah. We take authority over every distraction. We take authority over every lie of the wicked one. And by the power of the Spirit of God, we commit Brownsville into your hands. We commit the 73rd precinct into your hands. And we pray, Almighty God, that you begin to dismantle the forces of hell that have trapped our brothers and sisters. I pray this morning that you begin to break the yoke when we think of the addiction, the violence. Oh God, we know that in the eyes of man it seems impossible, but in the eyes of God we say I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so today, Father, we pray even for the community board 16. We pray, we pray for the district manager. We pray for the, the chair people of the various committees. We pray, Almighty God, that you will move Brownsville, raise up Brownsville, that God, be, rather than be known as the bottom, that you'll raise up Brownsville, God, as, an, as a neighborhood, that even those who may not know you will sense that something has shifted in the heaven. Your words declare, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness in high places. We bind the forces of hell that has bound our, our people, Father. And we pray today that, God, you will bring liberty to the hearts of your children. God, cause businesses that can raise the standard of living, cause businesses to see Brownsville as a viable option. I pray, God, that where the enemy has used violence to entrap our resident, that, God, you will break the back of the enemy in the name of Jesus. Those who may trade in guns, those who profit from the violence, I pray this morning that you will defeat them this morning. And I pray, Father, that you'll do a work that will bring glory and honor to your name. We know it's not by might nor by power, but Lord, it is by your spirit. So God, I pray this morning, let your spirit move in Brownsville. Let your spirit move, God, in every era of government and cause a transformation because of our transition in Jesus' name. I pray for those who may have listened to the word today Wherever you are and whatever you are battling, I want you to know that God is still able to break addiction. 
that God is still able to break the hold of sin. There's no habit so strong that God can't break. And it doesn't matter what the enemy may have used to be a yoke over your life this morning. We have good news. God is still able to break yokes. He's still able to dismantle shackles. And he's still able to bring liberty to your life. And so wherever you are, whether you're in the building or on the e-church platform, I want you to know that if you have a need in your life today, that God is still able to break the yoke. Maybe you're interceding for a partner or for a child or a parent. There is something about intercession. It's where we pray for each other that God might bring about his healing touch. Maybe you have not yet accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in the full pardon of your sins. But this morning, we want to invite you as we pray with you. Would you join with me today? If you're in this building or if you're on the E-Church, you can just put in the chat that this morning you need prayer. You, whatever information you'd like to share, we want to follow up with you. But we want you to know that your condition is not final, that God can still change. So if you would pray with me this morning, Lord Jesus, we humble our hearts before thee, grateful that you are a God of mercy. Even though the children of Israel missed out their opportunity 38 years earlier, God, you could have caused them all to perish in the wilderness, but you allowed them to walk a generation and everyone who was 20 years and younger, God, you allow them and Joshua and Caleb to cross over Jordan today. I pray for that person who is on the other side and needs to cross over to surrender their hearts. I pray for that person who, whose life may be caught in the trap of addiction, not liking how they're living, but feeling totally helpless. God, I pray that even today, they will feel your grace and your strength. And I pray, Father, that you'll give us the grace as children of faith to walk and believe you to bring to pass that which you have promised over our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. If you, you can put some your information, you can communicate with us either on live stream or you can call us at 718-385-1043. And we want you to know you don't, our focus is on the Brownsville area in, as we're in transition. But no, wherever you are, if you need prayer, by all means, we have four prayer points um, or prayer openings every weekday. We believe in prayer. If we can't give you money, if we can't offer you a job, we can surely pray for you that God will do his will in your life. Have a blessed day and God bless you.